So hi, hello everyone, and welcome to another Saturday live stream. Micro Hunter here again. Okay, I just uh, has again a couple of technical issues, but I hope uh, that everything works fine now and that you're able to hear me. Um, I see that uh, a lot of people already started to, to sign in and uh, to write comments here. Yeah, if you can hear me, please, uh, maybe you can post quickly um, into the comments section. The sound is fine, sound is okay. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, if you're uh, new to this uh, live stream, um, you can of course always post comments and uh, if you have any specific questions, um, please uh, specifically say write, write an at microbe hunter so that I know that um, I uh, basically that the message and the question is for me. Okay, so I see that uh, it seems to work fine now. Yeah, lots of people have already started to to, um, uh, to post here. Um, yeah, um, and today what I want to do, and this is I want to actually um, uh, yeah fulfill a request that uh, somebody asked me, I think two or three weeks ago. Somebody wanted to see um, all of my slides with human tissues on it. Okay, well, I have to be honest with you, I don't have that many that are labeled with human, but I do have a few that I would like to share with you um, today, and then we can look at those. Um, yeah, um, specifically, only five slides that are sp um, explicitly labeled uh, to be human from human beings. Okay, um, so that is an uh, epithelium. Um, over here, blood from the human body. This is, um, uh, this is uh, the head, skin, scalp, okay, with uh, some hair. Um, this is muscle, skeletal muscle of a human being, and it's bone of a human being. Now, I do have uh, several other slides as well um, that contain tissues, um, but uh, sometimes these are from, um, from other mammals and sometimes it's only labeled as, as being from a mammal. I mean those slides are labeled in German now but it says here these are all from mammals and it's not specified which type of mammal it is. Yeah, so it could be uh, that they're also human. Um, the thing is uh, the following that um, if you want to compare tissue between let's say humans and other mammals um, on that level it all looks the same. Um, so it really doesn't make a huge difference of whether you're looking at the blood of a, or the muscle um, of, of a human being or of a cow or, of, or of, a, you know, a pig or whatever, dog or cat, it, it all looks the same um, because on that level the tissue is, is very similar. Okay, So for this reason it doesn't make a huge difference but um, those five slides are ex actually labeled uh, that they are actually from a human being. Okay, um, so this uh, of course um, is, is quite interesting uh, because um, a couple of uh, months ago I did receive a, um, a question, email as a matter of fact, uh, from, uh, from a concerned person who bought him or herself a, a slide box of Amazon <laughs> um, and uh, then it actually indicate, said that this is tissue from a human being. And then this person was a little concerned and says, well, from ethical grounds, I mean, um, did the person give consent that, that, that basically the tissue is used? And I have to tell you, I'm not so much worried about that because in the medical field, when people donate uh, organs or their body, um, then um, yeah, there are so many, um, so much um, tissue available that um, there is no scarcity. Yeah? So there is uh, essentially it's, uh, stuff like this in, in, in the medical field is, is uh, made in very large quantities. Yeah? So there are plenty of... Uh, uh, organ donors available. Um, so what I'm going to do um, is, is I'm just going to put them under the microscope and we're going to have a look at a few of these uh, slides here. Um, some of them are explicitly labeled uh, humans, others are basically just from mammals and I can look also at a couple of others uh, from the slide box. Yeah, and, and that's basically it. Um, and uh, what I'm also going to do is um, I'm going to, um, as always, go through the comments every now and then and I'm going to look um, at uh, this at sign if there is a specific question for me and then I will uh, basically respond to that. I mean many people are um, yeah, uh, many people are actually also using the, the form to communicate the, the chat uh, to uh, um, uh, basically with each other but if there's a specific question to me then uh, please uh, indicate this. Yeah there is already one here. What happened to the one special slide you showed us a few times the one you could fill with quite a bit of liquid. I mean, we haven't seen that one for a long time. The one you could, ah, okay, I see. Um, huh, that's a good one, thank you for a reminder. Um, I think you're referring to the slide with a concave indentation, okay? 
I've got to be honest with you. Um, um, the few slides that I had, unfortunately, um, one of them that I had, I, I broke it. Um, so I need to reorder um, uh, them. But uh, th thank you for reminding me. I'll get uh, a few more. This is basically the slide, which is a little bit thicker, but which has a concave um, indentation so that you can store a little bit more liquid. Um, I'm going to um, order this also because um, of, of a so-called uh, hanging drop uh, method for, um, for observing bacteria. Okay, okay, um, yeah, so there are, yeah, somebody has got pathological slides as well. They might be from diseased uh, patients, yes, this is possible, but uh, usually um, people have to give uh, their consent, yeah. Um, yeah, and the fungus specimen, I think I must have somewhere over there. I can also look at this uh, then um, um, as well. So what I'm going to do now is, is um, I'm just going to jump over to the microscope view and uh, yeah, I'm going to show you now the, the, the worst slide, okay? Um, because this one slide is quite difficult, but it's uh, still good to illustrate an important concept. The, these are epithelial cells from the inside of, of, um, of the mouth. It's a commercial permanent slide, but it, it illustrates a little bit the problem of refractive index. It's a pretty bad slide, uh, but I will show you now uh, this here and then also a better way. Yeah, of course, there is a little bit of dirt, dust and dirt on here. Um, I will try to um, find the place first. It does take me a little bit of time to, um, yeah, to find the cells. You see that there is quite a bit of dirt um, on here as, as well. Okay, um, and uh, I'm go just going to zoom in a bit. So these are now basically human epithelial cells and uh, you're not going to see anything here quite well. Well, actually, I do already see them, but it illustrates uh, that they are very, very difficult to see. Okay, and luckily, I do have an arrow over here. So you do you see those here? This here, this here, this here, this here, this here. Not the round circles, yeah? But this faint thing here, these are epithelial cells um, of the mouth. And you see the contrast is pretty bad. Okay here as well. And I'm going to switch over now to bright field. The condenser is all the way closed. Okay. And um, what you see here, this here is one epithelial cell. And this dark dot that you see in the center, that's nucleus. Now this is pretty disappointing. Okay. And the reason why this is so difficult to see is, is uh, because I would say that the, probably the refractive index of the surrounding medium and the cell is very similar. So what I'm going to do now is, is I'm going to show you how this looks in phase contrast and then I'm going to actually uh, take some fresh sample from my mouth. Okay, so this is now a regular bright field, okay, um, 40 times. And now I'm going to show you phase contrast. So I have to change over to my phase contrast objective. I have to put in the phase contrast annulus by rotating this here. I have to open the condenser. I have to refocus a little bit. And this is what we get. Notice that uh, the contrast is now significantly better. Uh, the nucleus uh, can also be seen much better over here. Okay, and you can also see that there is, um, yeah, the cell itself has this darker edge and then there is a little bit brighter on the outside. That's also a typical phase contrast uh, yeah, phenomenon. Yeah. But um, honestly, I was not so happy with that slide, okay? But, uh, but still, I think it's, it's a nice, um, yeah, or here, a nice example of, of a very difficult to observe slide with a, of a very low contrast. So not all commercial slides are actually uh, good. Here are a few more cells. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to switch over again to bright field. So and for this reason, I'm going to um, yeah, uh, remove the, yeah. And this is how it looks in bright field. I'm going to close the condenser again all the way and you can see that much of the dirt becomes more visible. Yeah. So very bad contrast. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is, is um, yeah, primarily for those of you who don't know or have not seen this yet, I'm just going to show you how to make a, a, um, yeah, a, a sample from myself, from my own mouth. Okay. Um, and uh, then, um, yeah, we'll have, we'll have a look at this. Okay. But uh, I see that there are a couple of, of questions already here for me. 
I need to go down quickly and in the meantime I'm going to take some 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 samples okay mm-hmm you just basically rub a little bit here uh-huh okay so that's pretty much it okay and uh, there are plenty of cells on here then you do the following S spread the cells on the slide um, cover glass wouldn't uh, hurt I cleaned up everything before so here is a cover glass and of course we would like to have a little bit of trash cans over there and of course we would like to have a little bit of water as well okay so I'm going to put a little bit of water in, in the dish here. Then over here I have somewhere my pipette. Here it is. You take a little bit of, um, of the water on here. Cover glass goes on top. Um, excess liquid should always be removed. And uh, let's have a look again okay and now you will see the difference uh, hopefully <laughs> uh, the difference uh, between a fresh sample okay so let's uh, have a look first again so and uh, this is basically yeah we see plenty of cells let me see if uh, there is uh, a little bit more dense over here yeah let's have a look now again um, at uh, yeah the cells uh, you can see um, over here everywhere still very low magnification so let's uh, go a little bit higher brightness goes up and you can see that yeah they're much better visible already okay this is now DIC and uh, if you want to see the whole thing now in phase contrast let's center this um, a little bit again and this uh, kind of illustrates a little bit the importance of the uh, refractive index um, of uh, the sample with uh, the surrounding so let's open it okay and uh, this is basically how it looks like now yeah I need to turn up the brightness a little bit here um, as well on the camera yeah. and what you see already is is that uh, yeah you see um, again the nucleus and uh, actually also much more structural detail yeah. so you see that uh, it's the same no just a second let's do it like this I'm flipping out there so you see that uh, essentially um, yeah it's uh, exactly the same specimen uh, but now with a different uh, surrounding uh, mounting medium in this case water and therefore the difference in the refractive index already has a quite a significant impact here okay so this is, i just wanted to to show this a little bit as a demonstration i know it's uh, um yeah just uh, for the sake of uh, completion i just wanted to compare this okay so there is um a, another question um here what kind of notebook should i use for micro uh, microscopy notes uh, checked uh, um, basically squared or lined um it's a question of personal preference often obviously I personally always prefer um, for sciences I personally um, always prefer um, checkered ones however if you make drawings uh, some people like to make sketches and in this case uh, you want to use a notebook for keeping notes it has no lines at all and no uh, no um, no squares at all yeah f simply for for making drawings so um, I would say it's a more question of personal preference um, I personally um, always had problems with lined notebooks uh, because um, it never really fit the size of my um, my handwriting yeah um, but uh, yeah I would say the most important uh, thing is uh, is is that if you want to include sketches or drawings to make those on um, on on blank paper and then you can also glue it in for example yeah um, I personally have always used uh, checkered notebooks and made the drawings separately yeah uh, if I request pay for whole milk, should I get whole milk, not whatever is most convenient because most people drink 2% milk? Uh, 
I already had a similar comment somewhere. Some maybe you're the same uh, uh, viewer who was asking um, about whether you can use a microscope to determine um, the the per percentage of fat in milk. And I think this is not so easily possible. Of course, you're able to see the fat droplets in milk, um, but it, this does not tell you anything um, about um, the uh, the actual fat content. I mean, um, yeah. So uh, let's move on a little bit. The next slide that I would like to show you. Um, I want to, here we go, um, is a, a bone from a human being and uh, you notice already that there is this black ring around it and uh, this is a, a, a ringed slide and um, I already mentioned this before but why, why would I do that? Yeah of course it looks nice but that's not the primary reason. Um, this is um, always done uh, to protect the specimen and the mounting medium. Um, in, for some um, specimens, what they're doing is, is they're using a mounting medium called glycerin jelly or glycerol jelly, glycerin gelatin. And this is a mounting medium which uh, becomes semi-solid. So when you dry it, um, it will not dry completely, but it will remain in, um, it will still contain a lot of a um, certain amount of moisture and water. And those uh, mounting media, um, because they are only semi-solid, um, uh, have to be protected a little bit uh, from complete uh, dehydration um, and from moisture changes and therefore they put this ring um, around it and um, also it uh, fixes the cover glass to the slide better so it is also a better physical stability. So this is uh, the reason when you look at the slide box like I have over here okay um, you're going to see that some of the slides um, indeed um, have this ring here because um, of the mounting medium that has been used. Okay, so the ring actually tells you a little bit of uh, yeah of what mounting media the company or the person has uh, used. Okay, so we're now going to look at uh, at the compact bone um, um, of human beings. Okay, um, yeah. So let's um, have a look here. We always start again at the low magnification, and uh, I need to of course switch over to the microscope view. Okay, I have to put in the correct filter. That's to bright a little bit. Okay. Yeah. This is the this is the ring, by the way. Yeah. The black <laughs> the black uh, ring here. So the camera, um, of course, also has to adjust a little bit, and this is what we see. So we go in a little bit with the magnification here, and I'm going to now look uh, for something specific. This is what I look for. Okay. You see those round structures here. A little bit. Okay. Let's go up a little bit with the magnification here. Okay. Yeah, up here we go. Um, you notice uh, that um, when I'm going to use the arrow again, that uh, now some up now some parts. Just a second. Here, okay. You see that some parts um, are in focus while uh, while other parts are blurry, and this is the reason. Is is because the the cross section, the the cut, is, is not completely flat, but it's kind of yeah wavy and this means that when a part of it is in focus then another part which is higher or lower is out of focus and this explains why it's blurry over here so this has nothing to do with uh, bad uh, microscope optics but it's simply a, a question of, of a, basically a specimen that's not flat okay yeah so when I refocus then you're going to see that now uh, those parts here are in focus and, and those parts here are blurry okay uh, but let's uh, focus on one of those round structures here Okay, so this is a, a compact bone of a human being. Okay, let's always uh, go a little bit up. And uh, what we're able to see here is, is those uh, basically, um, yeah, these are the, the, the units, uh, osteons, I think they're called those units, but those dark things that you see, uh, there's a canal in here, but those dark structures that you see here, these are the bone cells. Okay, those dark dots here are individual cells. Might surprise some of you uh, that there are actually cells in bone. Bone is not a dead material. Bone, of course, is living. Um, yeah, in the center of the bone, of course, also blood cells are made, but the bone itself, of course, also has to regenerate. So there are inside here, these are essentially the individual bone cells that you're able to see here. Yeah. And there are also cross canals here and uh, those bone cells uh, their responsibility is of course also to deposit calcium um, yeah, into the bone then there are different types of bone cells that break down the the, the bone again yeah 
but um, I think very nice uh, to see here is also that those are their little yeah, uh, transversal canals, little extensions. Yeah, looks a little bit. Uh, these cells remind me a little bit of a nerve cell, really, uh, which also has those dendrites and axons. Yeah, but uh, yeah, of course, uh, these are uh, not nerve cells. Yeah, but um, it kind of illustrates also a little bit the, the density of the cells here, which is not so high, um, and uh, also that still overall there are quite a lot of cells in bone. Yeah, so bone is, as I said already, a living living material. And uh, yeah, and if you go to the other end here, this was where we had it at the beginning. Yeah, you're going to see it, it kind of looks a little bit much, uh, yeah, more longitudinal because it's a different cross section. Yeah, and not, not a cross; it's a longitudinal section, and therefore you don't uh, you don't see the the round structure anymore. Yeah, um, but uh, because it's cut differently. Yeah, yeah, but still, again, you are able to see those individual um, dark uh, bone cells here. I mean, <laughs> I know it's a crazy idea, but I mean, if you've got cells here, you've got DNA. So theoretically, what you could do is, is you could actually uh, extract the DNA and you could determine something about the person. So if it's a male or female, if you analyze the mitochondrial DNA, you can um, also localize the so-called the, the haplotype, which basically means that you can estimate the region from the uh, where the person is from. Yeah, um, so kind of fascinating as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, but um, as I said again, even though this is um, labeled to be from a human being, if you look at the bone of a, of a, from a different mammal, it's going to look exactly the same under the microscope. Yeah. So I'm going to pause again here, and I'm going to read again a couple of questions. Um, especially when I'm about to consume hot beverages, my mouth uh, braces itself a very intense, very specific ones. Experience doesn't. Have Okay, yeah, there's something about the hot beverages and the, the milk. <laughs> okay, um, how do I scroll down just a second? Okay. Um, yep. Um, does the inform uh, does um, again the milk question? Does all milk fat look the same under microscope? Um, essentially, what you have is this milk is a so-called an emulsion. So an emulsion means that uh, there, it's a mixture of oil and, and water and there are tiny oil droplets, microscopic oil droplets in milk. And uh, what you are able to do is, is you're able to dilute a little bit of milk with water and then you're able to see those individual dots, the oil droplets, and what they do is, is they're so small that they bounce around by Brownian motion. Right, um, but essentially, just I don't know. Maybe maybe you could estimate the number of oil droplets that are there in a certain liquid, uh, a certain volume. But honestly, I think this is um, this is going to be a little bit complicated. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah. So essentially, I've never tried this. Uh, if you're able to determine the 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 fat content of milk by counting the fat droplets under the microscope. I mean, I think the the, the counting mistake and error, the measurement error, might even be larger, uh, might be quite large. So I don't know if you're able to distinguish now between three percent and two percent or whole milk. And honestly, when you now take the milk and when you put it into coffee, then again you have a different, totally dilute concentration anyway. Right? So whether how much um, uh, fat is in your coffee ultimately depends on, on the ratio of milk uh, um, to coffee okay so because uh, you're diluting the, the, the fat as well yeah um, does the information on this uh, that's kind of interesting I have a problem now a little bit uh, um, uh, moving the how do I scroll down um, does the information on the slide describe that the bone cells are osteoclast or no or both no it doesn't uh, uh, there is no um, there is no description on the slide, but because we were looking at a, um, a, the, a complete cross section, we're going to find uh, um, all types of bone cells um, on, on the slide. Um, this is not a selection of specific type of bone cells, but uh, unless they use some kind of specific staining, yeah, um, I would say that this is not a, a yeah, uh, yeah. Um, they, they didn't uh, use uh, any uh, yeah, specific staining. I guess they stained all cells and therefore you cannot distinguish this. Yeah? So, um, okay. 
Uh, I'm going down again. I hope I'm not overlooking anything. Otherwise, I'm just going to move on to the next. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next slide. This is, by the way, 60 times. And here. Yeah. Uh, I just also, by the way, I just also want to il illustrate something here. Maybe I did not show this to you yet. Um, this is my 60 times uh, um, objective. Um, and it has a, a, a something that you can turn here. You see this? Okay. Um, and this is a fine adjustment to adjust to cover glass thickness. So what you're supposed to do actually when everything is in focus, you're supposed to adjust it in such a way that um, everything is absolutely crisp. Yeah? So this is uh, this to adjust uh, for cover glass thickness, yeah? just uh, in case you were wondering. Okay. okay. So, okay, so this was basically the, the bone, okay. So let's, uh, I'm, I'm just looking, I kind of lost a little bit of the, the chat. So let's have a look. Um, this was the yeah, epithelium, the bones, then what is, yeah, this one is actually um, a quite a nice one here. Um, this one, it seems to be, I don't, unfortunately they didn't say how it was stained, but this is now the scalp from, from, um, from the hair, from the head of a person. It's actually a, a one of the, I would say, one of the more colorful slides. They must have used some kind of, uh, yeah, specific staining here um, um, as well. Let me close the condenser a bit. So, bright field. Yeah, and uh, what do we see here? This uh, seems to be some fat tissue. Let's see if we're able to reach the end and let's, let's see which one is top which one is bottom okay this seems to be uh-huh let me see okay ah yeah let's let's have a look at a few things here maybe we're able to identify um, a few things that what we're able to see here um but i need a lower magnification here because this is actually better yep Okay, so this is uh, basically the cross section uh, through the scalp um, of um, of a person, and what we see here is, is those large red things here. They seem to be the hair follicles, and uh, those large red structures here, um, and. Uh, what they do is, is uh, yeah, there is uh, hair essentially uh, being formed here, and. Uh, you, you might wonder a little bit why um, is it uh, sometimes a little bit uh, oval? Why is it not going all the way through? It? And that's because uh, it is cut so thin that sometimes, uh, yeah, you're cutting that it's cut diagonally. Okay, so that means uh, you do not see the full you do not see the full um, full hair. So what we seem to have here is um, is is that this is a hair follicle where you have hair forming inside here, and these seem to be the cells out here that actually make uh, the hair. So we zoom in a little bit, and then we can actually see. Always turn up the turn up the the brightness a little bit, and then we can see the following. We can see that uh, there are of course individual cells here. You see the individual the, the small circles are the nuclei, okay? And this uh, here in the center, which uh, seems to be the hair, is much more fibrous, and you do not see any individual cells. Yeah. So the whole thing here seems to be the hair follicle, okay? And the reason why the hair um, it looks, uh, yeah, basically already stops here. Is is because um, uh, it's been cut across, okay? Yeah, so it kind of um, it continues on a different uh, height, yeah. And for this reason, we don't don't see that. So that's uh, basically one thing. Uh, another thing that we're able to see that's also um, is and these usually um, what you have is is those larger cells usually are um, they're often fat uh, fat cells. And those blue structures here, that uh, seems to be like the cross section of muscles. Okay, so um, yeah, so we're going to look at skeletal muscle again, um, and looks very similar, uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, to what we have over here. Yeah, so you, it, it actually looks like uh, it reminds you a little bit of uh, yeah of, of, of raw meat. Uh, okay, in the cross section, indeed, indeed that's uh, the, the, what meat is is actually muscles. Yeah? So again, here we are able to see the individual cells over here. Yeah, it seems to be a fat tissue. Yeah, 
and then occasionally if we're lucky it could be that this is a blood vessel over here with with uh, blood cells yeah. but very nicely visible the different layers that you're able to see here yeah. I think we go down down a little bit with the magnification to get a better overview okay or maybe even yet lower I think that's much uh, much better yeah you can actually see um, how the the red colored in red um, yeah next to each other all of the hair being formed yeah. and this uh, seems to be the surface here yeah. and this over here I think and that's also quite interesting seems to be a muscle that pulls um, on the hair let me have a look this here because um, when you're feeling cold the hair starts uh, to stand up and rises and this is because they're tiny muscles that actually pull um, on the hair and this seems to be one of those muscles okay and it should actually connect somewhere over here yeah to the hair somewhere over there okay yeah so let me uh, read a couple of uh, of uh, 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 questions again i don't even know i don't even know where i left off um whole milk we talked about this okay does methylene blue work well to stain epithelial cells? Ah, what a question. Uh, here it is, methylene blue. You know what, thank you for the reminder. Um, I actually wanted to demonstrate this to you um, as well. Um, yeah, um, let's, let's do a little bit of, of methylene blue staining. Yes, it works well, okay? Um, so what I'm gonna do now is, is uh, I hope I got the correct slide now. This seems to be the, is this the correct slide? Yes, this is the correct slide. Let's go bright field. Um, and I'm going to add now of, on the side, yeah, a, a little bit of methylene blue and let's see how this works, okay? Always when you do this, you gotta be a little careful that you do not drop any uh, stain on the objective itself. And you see that it's already starting to soak in. And now you tell me if methylene blue works well. <laughs> of course it does, look at this. Isn't this beautiful? Okay, you see that the, the epithelial cells immediately start to absorb the methylene blue and they stain darker uh, than the surrounding. That's the whole point of the stain uh, because they have such a high affinity for the uh, stain um, that uh, it did turn more blue than the surrounding medium. Okay, it's called Löffler's solution. It's a ready-made mixture of methylene blue. Yeah. And then uh, also very nice, you can now also see the, the nucleus, yeah, quite nicely. Yeah, I wonder what this is here. I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, of course, uh, you might also find uh, when you put saliva under the microscope, of course, you're also going to find, uh, how do you say, you're going to find, uh, of course, also bacteria, but I don't know what this is, honestly. Stuff in my mouth. <laughs> Here you see whole, yeah, several of these cells together. Yeah. I, I actually, I think this looks actually way better, better than the commercially prepared slide. <laughs> okay, so let me quickly check again. Um, I, I'm reading the um, yeah uh, I'm reading the whole thing. Um, uh, can you do dark field or oblique uh, on the epithelial cells? It's another question. I can do. <laughs> unfortunately, yes, I can do dark field, but only with my four times objective. And that is the problem that I have. So this basically means that uh, um, you're not able to see a lot. Okay, so this is the, yeah, this is now dark field using the four times objective. Yeah, and you see that uh, the, yeah, the blue dots that you see over there, these are of course the epithelial cells. 
and all of the white dots that you see is dust and dirt. Yeah? So yeah, my microscope's not equipped <laughs> yeah, otherwise. Yeah. Um, okay, just a second. I'm, I'm reading again. This was the mescaline blue question. Maybe you could stain the sample with it, ink to make it even more visible. I don't have ink not right now, but it actually does work. What you can do is you can try fountain pen ink. And this fountain pen ink, uh, you have to dilute a little bit, um, otherwise it's going to be too dark. Okay, um, so this is, uh, but the fountain pen ink also um, um, also works. Okay. Yeah. So, um, can we also do an analysis of dog saliva versus cat saliva? <laughs> sure, <laughs> you can try everything, but uh, usually what you have is, is uh, when you take samples like this, you're going to find so many different things on there, it might be difficult to identify what you see. Okay. Uh, does all milk fat look the same under the microscope? Um, honestly, yes, because essentially you, um, you, uh, fat looks like fat, you're not able to see the uh, um, you're not able to see the uh, the actual molecular structure of, of the fat um, and uh, it's a fat droplets and uh, what you're able to see are the fat droplets and, and, and otherwise uh, you're not able to do to see differences here microscopes are not able to resolve the molecular structure obviously um, so the only thing that you're able to to see are the fat droplets that you find in the milk yeah Okay, um, this was the question about the bone cells. I'm going down again, just a second. Lots of questions, a lot of communication. The sample prep for this colorful specimen is good, okay. <laughs> um, um, let me see. Um, Imagine buying a slide with a scalp sample and you end up with a sample from a bald person and there are no hair follicles. Um, that's an interesting one. It could be that there are even a bald person might have hair follicles, but maybe for whatever reason, um, yeah, maybe no hair is produced. Okay, so that would be actually quite interesting to find out is, is what is uh, um, essentially how does it look uh, in, in a bald person. Would that be a reason to get a refund? <laughs> I don't think so, because it's still the scalp of a person. <laughs> okay. Um, I like the theme um, of looking at samples from a certain group of animals. Do you have some slides with amphibian tissue like frog skin? I don't have frog skin, but I can show you some frog, um, I can show uh, frog blood. Um, as a matter of fact, I can do that uh, later on. Uh, but let me finish uh, this here first, um, because uh, yeah, the next thing that I want to show you is um, <laughs> blood, human blood. Um, now, if you've been watching my videos, and uh, many people put blood under the microscope, and uh, of course, mostly you see red blood cells, but I think this does not look very interesting, okay? Gotta be very honest with you. Because this is of course a um, yeah permanent slide. And uh, this is how it looks like. Those uh, circles are red blood cells. And uh, red blood cells are quite delicate. It means they like to lose their shape quite easily. And what you see over here is, is when they dry, because the red blood cells are flexible, look how they <laughs> kind of uh, deform so that they kind of, uh, almost like a mosaic, they kind of fit next to each other kind of, yeah. So this is a little bit the, the thing what happens when you start to dry blood up uh, in a very thin layer, then uh, they kind of deform a little bit and they start to, yeah, it's almost like they, they match together like puzzle pieces. Yeah, especially look at this one over here. Yeah, so it kind of illustrates very much how flexible red blood cells are. Um, however, I personally, uh, yeah, think uh, if you look at blood live under the microscope, it's much more interesting. So what I did is, uh, yeah, I'm just going to show you again one of my videos. Some of you have already seen them already. Um, in, yeah, so let, yeah, these are basically now that's a video. Um, red blood cells, uh, my own. And uh, you notice one thing, and that's also the reason why I kind of showed it to you. Oh my gosh, the red blood cells are stacking up. 
It's called rouleau formation. Rouleau. Um, and why is it? Why are they doing that? Uh, some people who see that they start to freak out. It's not a time lapse. Also mine, my blood. Uh, I just want to show you. Let's go back a little bit again in the video. Here. And so you see that um, they are kind of uh, stacking, stacking up. Just a second. Yeah. Yeah, in little uh, like a, in kind of little rolls of uh, of coins almost. Yeah? Why are they doing that? It's a completely normal phenomenon that you see when blood starts to coagulate. Yeah? So this uh, slide is already starting to dry up, um, and what what's going to happen is is that the blood cells they start to stick together, and uh, in a different part of the slide you're going to see that this does not happen. And whether this happens or not also depends a little bit on the thickness of the blood layer because if uh, there is uh, not enough space uh, between the cover glass and the slide and the red blood cells are not able to form uh, stack up like this and then they're pressed flat yeah, and they're not able to go into this uh, configuration right but this is a, a totally normal thing that happens when blood starts to dry and um, i just want to show you uh, when we go back here now this is a time lapse let me move the arrow out of the way. So this here is a um, a time lapse, okay. And uh, what you are able to see here is is uh, that uh, yeah, here the blood cells don't stack up because I used much little less blood and therefore they're not able to stack up because they're kind of pressed flat. But you are also able to see a white blood cell moving around, um, and you're also able to do the white blood cell is this guy over here, okay. And you're also able to see that some of the cells just kind of start start to look a little bit of this strange wrinkly shape. Yeah, and let me pause again. Why is that? Again, where is the arrow here? Okay, you see this is the, the white blood cell, and some they look a little bit weird. And this is also a sign that the sample starts to dry up and that the red blood cells are losing now water. And when they start to lose water by osmosis, then they have uh, the membrane becomes too large compared to the volume and then it starts to wrinkle up like this. Yeah? Um, so also this is a, a process that you're, you're able to kind of follow uh, over the next several minutes. You, you see that at the beginning, the red blood cells all look the same. Um, and then um, as the blood sample starts to dry up, um, you see that um, different phenomena happening. The red blood cells, they start to to shrivel up um, and especially when you start to add a little bit of salt um, to the specimen this is when um, the red blood cells really lose a lot of water and then they really all of the, all of them kind of uh, start to become deformed if you add distilled water then they're going to swell up and become completely spherical yeah so you can change the 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 shape of the red blood cells by by controlling a little bit the, the salt concentration yeah so quite quite fascinating um, uh, to observe this just some kind of uh, suggestions <laughs> if you want to try something else. Yeah, out. Yeah. Um, uh, why didn't I see the white blood cells in the commercial prepared blood slides? Okay, that's an interesting one. Um, I, I would assume that they are there, but maybe they were not properly stained, number one. And number two, there are much fewer white blood cells than red blood cells. So maybe if I were to look for them, then maybe you're going to find them. Um, indeed, when you uh, look at uh, um, simply a blood sample under the microscope, because the um, white blood cells, they move kind of slowly, therefore you also do not always see them quite easily. So, but in the time lapse, then you're able to see that uh, as the, water ev the, the blood plasma evaporates uh, and the blood starts, starts to spread, the white blood cells, they might move into a different direction the, um, than the rest of the red blood cells, which are kind of swept away with a general flow. Yeah. So this is kind of the, the, the thing. It's a question of visibility, I would say. Yeah. So right now they are, the blood cells are moving because um, the blood starts to spread beneath uh, the cover glass. Yeah. It's, uh, and then of course the, the white blood cells that are moving around, they don't care so much about that. And uh, look, there are several of those. L let, me go, let, me go, let me do this again here. Because there are actually several of these white blood cells here. Here it is. Uh, there's one over here. There's one up here in the corner. Okay. Here um, as well. One over here. Yeah, so this this one is moving down here as well. So you see that, um, and sometimes this motion is is uh, um, much more easily visible if you actually uh, speed it up. I, th I made it now 30 times faster than in, in real real life. Yeah. And this one is not uh, uh, made faster. Okay. So. Um, yeah. 
Uh, nice, I saw your neutrophil moving around. Next time you may consider to inject some microbes in your blood sample to see how the immune cells are going to act after them. Yes, this is uh, actually quite interesting. I've seen um, uh, that there was somewhere a short video where people introduced some, um, some I don't know, was it a tiny worm or so on the microscope slide and then basically you could actually see that uh, after a couple of minutes the white blood cells started to attack that. Yeah, so this is indeed also something that uh, one might try out. Yeah. So I'm skipping down, I'm skipping down. Okay, okay, I hope I didn't uh, overlook anything. Um, any questions? I hope I didn't overlook any questions now. Okay, okay. Um, so let's move on. So this was basically blood. Um, you know what, because I, I just mentioned and I might forget about it. Um, I want to just show you just I know even though we said it's uh, we're just going to talk about human beings but it doesn't matter um, I have um, also a slide somewhere of the blood of a frog because that is also quite interesting but I don't know where it is just a second I need to check here so here are the plants down here Look, it's even typed with an uh, old typewriter. It's that old. It's, I guess it's from the 1970s or 1980s. So... So these are again the, the plants here. Yeah. Testes of a cat, ovary of a cat, embryo of a chicken, bird's feather, kidney of a cat, eye, the, the retina of a cat, Tongue of a of a rabbit. Okay, so not here either. I hope I, I'm able to find it. So it's a smooth muscle. It doesn't say it all. Yeah, blood of frog number twenty three. Here we go. Okay. Yes. Um, here it is. So. Um, because we just had a look at the blood of a human being, so let's have a look at the blood of a frog, of an amphibian, because uh, there is an interesting difference, very interesting difference. Okay, let me go up with the magnification, because it's a, a very char important characteristic. So these are the red blood cells of a frog, and what do you notice? They have a nucleus, okay? So you see that uh, these are the red blood cells and they have this dark purple spot in the center, okay? That's the nucleus. Um, uh, the red blood cells of mammals, including humans, obviously, they do not have a nucleus. So red blood cells are packed full with hemoglobin and they have lost, uh, during development, uh, they have lost the nucleus. Yeah? And in uh, frogs and other amphibians, the red blood cells have a nucleus. Just so, yeah, a little, because we were just talking about blood, <laughs> okay? Yeah, so let's move on. Um, the, one of the more interesting, I think, at least I think it's, it's kind of interesting, is, is the skeletal muscle. And then if you want, we can look at a, a couple of other sample slides here as well um, from, uh, from other mammals. It doesn't specify whether it's from a human being or not. And this one is now the skeletal muscle um, of a human being. Okay. So let me have a look here. Yes, and I think skeletal muscle is quite interesting for a variety of reasons. And if you want to observe skeletal muscle yourself, I did make a video some time ago where I put some chicken meat under the microscope. And uh, I'm going to, so, and these are now the muscle fibers. And I have to go up really high with the magnification. Maybe I'm going to, and I'm going to close that and here we go. Yeah, so some of you might be already familiar with this, but that is skeletal muscle of a human being and there is something very typical, okay? And please also watch the video about the, where I put some chicken meat under the microscope because you can also see it and it's very easy to, uh, for you to try it as well. Do you actually see that, oh, now again I changed the size of the arrow, do you actually see that there are those stripes, okay? These are so called the light and the dark bands of skeletal muscle. 
and that is due to um, the overlapping of, of protein fibers it's called actin and myosin so they are protein fibers that slide past each other and this is how the muscle contracts yeah and uh, by the arrangement um, of uh, how the these protein fibers are arranged you see under the microscope those light and dark bands and being able to see that is a little bit like a, also a little bit of a quality check of your microscope is are, are you able to resolve this so i'm using a 60 times uh, um, objective maybe i'm able to adjust this a little bit yeah and these are the typical light and dark bands and why skeletal muscle is interesting is because a little bit like a, like a, like a fungus um, yeah there are long muscle fibers um, which can be around 30 centimeters long uh, foot long okay um, and uh, basically those uh, um, those uh, are long muscle fibers uh, that contain hundreds of nuclei it's almost like uh, basically one large huge cell um, containing hundreds of nuclei uh, because the protein fibers that are responsible for contracting um, kind of run through the whole muscle fiber yeah? and uh, so this means that uh, you were not able to see the individual cells here because actually it can be seen as one long structure yeah? Occasion, there have been cases, uh, not cases, there have been certain places rather here where we could actually see the individual, uh, the nuclei as well. Depends a little bit. But um, again, here you can see the, quite nicely the, the so called the striations, the light and the dark bands. Let's go down a little bit with the magnification again. Yeah, here depending on longitudinal or cross section yeah. Yeah. so you see the typical structure of a skeletal muscle of a human being yeah. but uh, if you as I said before put the chicken meat under the microscope as well you're also going to see those light and the dark bands so I would not be able to see uh, to say which um, animal it is just by looking at the tissue under the microscope okay yeah. again here those nice uh, striations that you see here okay um, yeah let me go um, again through the questions the frog blood cells actually look a lot like their eggs <laughs> yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah um, in a human, there is no nucleus in the red blood cells because that the way the red blood cells can take more oxygen, right? Yes, because uh, it's packed full with hemoglobin, which carries oxygen. Yeah. So I'm wondering why the, there is a nucleus in the frog blood. Now, interesting. Um, <laughs> let's put it this way. I'm going to maybe give you um, an, an, an answer that um, is probably will not satisfy you um, because it also works uh, sometimes there are multiple solutions and I can imagine that maybe mammals have a much higher oxygen requirement and um, therefore it is maybe necessary that uh, all of the space is used for carrying hemoglobin and you can imagine that mammals uh, also being cold, cold blooded animals uh, can down regulate their metabolism this way and uh, basically it's fine the way it is so maybe um, they don't have this high oxygen requirement and therefore there's also not the need um, uh, to uh, to actually pack uh, the red blood cells full uh, with uh, with hemoglobin, um, so for them it works the way it is. So one always has to say, say in, say in biology, it's a little bit of a philosophical question. Is is it's good enough? You know, um, very very often I'm a biology teacher in school as well, and very often the students ask me the question, well, what is the advantage of certain things? I mean, yeah, you know, look at the biodiversity that we have, so many different animals and plant species in the world. And, and you know, what advantage is there? And then I'm saying, um, yeah, would it not, not be a, an advantage for us human beings to, I don't know, maybe also have eyes in the back, you know, two eyes in front, two eyes in the back. Then we could also see if there is some kind of a tiger coming from behind. Wouldn't this be um, an advantage for humans, right? One could ask. And this is actually the example that I'm always giving. Yeah. But then the answer is, is yeah, maybe, but it's good enough the way that it works right now yeah, for us as a species to survive. Yeah. And uh, one always has to, to um, yeah, see it in relation is, is um, does it work good enough? 
Yeah? So for us human beings, uh, having two eyes is good enough for survival. Yeah? Um, and so, um, and uh, yeah, so there is no um, absolute standard, I would say, uh, yeah, of what is uh, what is required. But uh, it's always a question of of, of um, do the certain biological features that the certain animal or plant have is it enough uh, to ensure the survival of, of the species? Yeah? So uh, in, in that sense, um, a little bit also with the, the blood cells. Um, um, yeah, because for frogs, um, it's enough uh, to carry the oxygen that they need. Yeah. yeah so um, could, you, uh, could you tell between fungi and chicken meat? OK, the thing is the following. The so-called the, the, um, the, the fungi, it's the so-called the aseptide fungi. I also made a video um, a couple of days ago. Um, also are fungi which have long hufe cells that contain multiple nuclei. Um, a little bit similar to skeletal muscle which are long cells which also contain multiple nuclei. And that's actually those fungi and the muscle cells that kind of are a little bit um, special cases of the cell theory. Because normally we think of a cell having a nucleus, at least eukaryotes, right? Um, and that's kind of the, the idea that we have um, of, uh, and if you have a multicellular organism like a human being and you have many cells, each cell has its own nucleus. And all of a sudden we are having all of those strange cases where essentially we have muscle fibers that are essentially contain hundreds, even thousands of nuclei, fungi, fu fungi which contain long hufe that contain multiple nuclei. We've got red blood cells in mammals which don't have a nucleus. Yeah? So if you look in biology uh, hard enough, you're always going to find very interesting special cases or exceptions to the rule. Yeah? Um, so um, there, it's, uh, that's a little bit fascinating that uh, you learn something in biology and you say, yeah, a eukaryotic cell has a nucleus and then all of a sudden you realize, well, hmm, <laughs> red blood cells in mammals, they don't. Yeah? Um, so there are always these exceptions. Yeah? Um, so, uh, hello, I just joined. Would you be able to briefly recap what we're visualizing? Um, today, I was, uh, this one over here is skeletal muscle of a human being. I was looking at a, a couple of cells, um, slides, not slides, um, of humans that were actually labeled as being from a human. Um, however, I just want to show you also some other mammalian slides. So this was basically the skeletal muscle. This was the blood from a frog, not a, not a human, but just the blood of a human being here, the, the scalp the bone and uh, the epithelium uh, where I t took some sample. And I, I've got a few other things here that I just wanted to show you. And one of the nice ones, <laughs> it's uh, ironic a little bit, and I've al also made videos of this, is are the testes, in this, in this case of a mouse. But again, because a mouse is a, a mammal and humans are mammals, um, it looks the same um, under the microscope. And this is um, actually, interestingly, the testes are interestingly one of those um, things that look relatively <laughs> attractive very dirty slide okay yeah and this is basically the places where the sperm cells are made cross section and what we have here this is a uh, so-called this cross section of a seminiferous tubule and what you have in here those tiny lines that you see these are the tails of the sperm cells yeah? So basically, this is a, a seminiferous tubule, a cross section, and the sperm cells are being produced um, as the cells move inwards. And then the finished uh, sperm cells essentially end up in the center here and are carried away. Yeah? And this is the, the reason, this is here testes of a mouse, but again, um, if you look at it uh, um, of any other mammal, it looks uh, the same. Yeah? Um, because on that level, a uh, cellular level, on, on that uh, tissue level, histological level, you cannot really uh, see a difference. Yeah? So this is a, a little bit, uh, um, yeah, um, I think also one of the reasons why uh, many of the slides that are, can also be used for, for teaching and, and so on, even though you're teaching the human body, um, very often you're using slides of other animals uh, because they also work. Yeah? Here, this is an interesting one here. It says the artery and vein of a mammal, and it does not specify which mammal it is. Okay. Again, again it doesn't really matter. And I uh, wonder if you're able to detect the artery and the vein. Uh, remember, arteries are those blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart, and veins are those blood vessels that carry blood to the heart. Okay, and as a matter of fact, you're able to see both of them here. 
okay but I'm going to now use the arrow uh, again a cross section so this here is an artery here which carries blood away from the heart you see that the wall of the artery is fairly thick there are some red blood cells in here and this large structure here is the is a blood vessel this is the vein and it's pressed together yeah so basically if, it, if it's the vein like this kind of pressed together like flat yeah um, and this uh, shows also that the vein has a very thin wall on the side it's very uh, because the blood has a low blood pressure so there is basically no need to have a thick wall here for example you need to have a thick wall yeah? so let's have a look maybe we're able to see some of the red blood cells in here okay by by going a little bit further with the magnification always recenter okay and here again yeah honestly this looks pretty deformed <laughs> it, I can imagine that maybe during the processing that maybe the cells were kind of destroyed but I do not see the very nice round structure of the red blood cells okay yeah okay yeah but I think you get the idea that uh, you know, this here is uh, the thick wall um, of the artery it has to withstand a high blood pressure as already said okay so um, let, let me go back to the chat a little bit okay uh, frog blood cells actually look a lot like their eggs yes we talked about that I already answered this I think there's nothing for me now in here okay Is this an artery sample? Oh uh, yeah, okay, uh, basically it's a sample of artery and vein. Yeah, as I just mentioned before, let me turn this down again. Yeah, yeah. so here, here we go again, at four times, with a four times objective. Uh, this is an artery cross section, thick wall, and this here is uh, the inside of the vein. Okay, cross section. And a whole bunch of other tissue here. Yeah. So uh, kind of interesting. One of the things that I kind of noticed is is the following, and I don't know how they've done this. Something I'm going to research. Notice that uh, uh, over here, look here. This is uh, the edge of the cover glass. It's a round cover glass. I mean, you see it also here in the corner, right? It's the edge of the cover glass. But when you go in, you can actually see that the actual specimen is inside this block of yeah, foil like thing here yeah so it was embedded in, in some kind of a resin I suppose yeah and then also cut yeah so that, that's quite interesting to see you see that uh, essentially it is also embedded in some kind of a resinous material which was then cut so there must have been some kind of a block here um, normally what or traditionally what they've used is they've used always paraffin wax and this paraffin wax is then removed but over here this whatever substance it is uh, whatever curing material it is yeah is still present yeah, it's, it's quite interesting yeah. so I don't know if um, if uh, you know a little bit more about that would be interested in, in actually knowing how they've uh, how, how they have done that yeah. Yeah. so okay why does the vein look so weird um, yeah, the vein looks <laughs> like a number two over here because um, I will actually show you. Um, you know what? I'm going to use a piece of paper here. I'm going to use a piece of paper as a demonstration. You know what? I'm, I'm just going to switch over to the desk view. Let's say that this is the blood vessel vein, okay? And because it is has a very thin wall, okay, it can be compressed like this. And that's what we've been looking at. Okay? That's why it has uh, these folds in, in here. Yeah? Because it uh, it's it's not very it's not very strong. Yeah? 
Yeah, so this kind of uh, um, tells you also a little bit about the, the, the strength of the blood vessel and that it actually must be a vein. It is a vein because um, uh, arteries uh, have to have a very thick wall to withstand the blood pressure. Okay? And this kind of is the, is the reason why it looks, uh, uh, looks the way it does. Yeah? So, ah, haha, so I just uh, yeah, I see an interesting one. Do you have a lung tissue sample? Yes, I have, not of a human being, but it doesn't matter because, as I told you, uh, in, uh, in humans it looks the same. But where is it? I don't, I don't know where it is. I have to look here again. Uh, skeletal muscle and bone, nope, not here. Lung is... Uh, also, I made a video uh, some time ago about, about the lung. Lung, number 27, of a cat. Here it is. Yeah. Cat lung. And uh, let's have a look here. Because we're actually able to see the alveoli. Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, again, it's why in a human being it looks the same, so it doesn't really matter. This is how a lung, a lung looks like. Very spongy, and all of those white spaces that you see in here are the alveoli, the ear sacs. But let's zoom in a bit. Okay. And let's zoom in a bit because if we're a little bit lucky, we should also be able to see, I think, this uh, again, blood vessels here. Okay, because what will happen is is that the air, the oxygen in the air, will diffuse into the blood vessels, and the carbon dioxide will diffuse out. Yeah, it's kind of uh, shows you also a little bit how delicate the the lung actually is. Yeah. yeah. Um, why are there so many folds and so on? Because of course you want to have a large surface area for gas exchange, so that CO two is able to leave the blood. And we exhale it and oxygen is able to enter the blood. Heard somewhere that uh, the total lung surface area of one person is around the size of an apartment. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let's go in yet a little bit further. Yeah. And we're now able to eat, again see the individual cells and the, the nuclei. Yeah. So these are the individual ear sacs or alveoli. Yeah. So again, the lungs are not hollow, but they are actually like a sponge. Yeah. They're one of the nice, I mean, it, uh, we take this so much for granted, but uh, back 250 years ago, I mean, simply to realize that uh, the cell is the basic building block of living things that essentially doesn't really matter what you're looking at. Uh, ultimately you're ending up at a cellular organization. This was a remarkable discovery. I mean, we take it for granted now. Yeah, of course, all living things are made of cells. Yeah, who cares, you know, it's, it's clear, right? Um, but back in the day when they discovered it, this was a, 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 a really a remarkable thing because all of a sudden they had one uh, thing that could explain all living things. All, one thing that all living things had in common is this, this cellular organization kind of one, one model, one theory, so to say, that kind of explains the, 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 the design or the, the, the structure rather, or the, 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 yeah, the composition um, of, 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 of all living things is this cellular organization. And this was um, when folks discovered this, um, yeah, Schleiden, Schwann, Wirtschaft, whoever was involved yeah, at that time, was quite a remarkable and important discovery. Do you use a dust cover for your microscope when it's not in use? Do you clean the stage after some time? Oh, embarrassing question for me. Um, yes, I'm using a dust cover, but I don't put it on every day. Okay, because I keep on using the microscope so often that um, essentially, um, yeah, I sometimes uh, don't put it on. But when I don't use it for several days, I always put it on. Um, dust is very difficult to avoid. Yeah. So what I usually do is, is um, I use uh, um, a dust brush where I don't even know where to put it uh, to sometimes uh, brush it off. Yeah. Or some compressed air 
uh, but not uh, from a can, spray can, but um, actually um, from a, um, a basically pump up a bottle uh, with a bicycle pump and this compressed air is uh, gives some compressed puffs of air that I'm able to clean off um, also some of the dust. And the stage, what I do with the stage is, is I uh, occasionally wipe it off using some moist tissue paper. Yeah. So that's essentially all I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, I'm new to the epithelial reason. I'm wondering. Okay. Let me quickly see. I would be interested to view the normal and inflamed lung tissues together. Um, essentially, um, that would be interesting to see. I can explain to you how um, lung tissue with emphysema looks like. And I mean, this is uh, from a cat, so a cat is uh, <laughs> not smoking or anything. But uh, what uh, a lung tissue that um, essentially of a person who has got emphysema uh, would be like this, that some of those or many of those cross walls that you see here um, would be broken down. Okay, so um, and this basically would mean that it would look a little bit more like over here. And this is because it was cut too thin, it was removed, but essentially then you have uh, those ear sacs, the alveoli joining together, and this reduces uh, the surface area to the extent that gas exchange cannot happen anymore. So damaged lungs um, of emphysema would have uh, basically larger, much larger uh, yeah, alveoli. Yeah? And then this, of course, significantly reduces the ability to take up oxygen. Yeah? The reason why over here you have those large air spaces, I think that's uh, because of a, um, of a preparation artifact. Yeah? So if you cut it too thin, then you're kind of ripping away some of those walls, and then it also becomes larger like this. Yeah? Like you see here, it's a little bit torn up. Yeah? So, but yeah. So, um, That looks uh, nor yeah, like normal lung tissue. Yes, it's uh, again. This is uh, from a cat. Yeah, I got a cheap microscope for fifty dollars and it was able to view bacteria at one thousand six hundred magnification with high image quality. That's pretty good. Okay, if you got a cheap one, the bacteria are generally difficult to observe because they have a low contrast. Yeah. Would, it, would I be able to prepare a slide from the pig bone left over from dinner if you're somehow able to cut it very thin or to polish it down to very thinly then yes otherwise I recommend that you look at it using a stereo microscope but then I think you still won't be able to see the individual cells yeah? uh, they are epithelial in the lung t yes. uh, basically the epithelial cells are those uh, that line the, uh, the, the surface so uh, epithelial cells you would actually find primarily not in the center here but lining the surface and they're kind of difficult to see over here but this would be the cells that would be kind of lining the surface of, of the um, of the alveoli um, these are usually flat thin cells um, that uh, basically allow for easier gas exchange and there are a whole bunch of other cells in here as well of course blood vessels you find you find cells, the so-called the pneumocytes, they're two different types, type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes. Um, there are cells that uh, produce also uh, 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 surfactant, which prevents uh, the alveoli from sticking together and from collapsing. Yeah, so, that's, uh, so there are even here um, a variety of different cell types involved, but the epithelial cells are usually those that um, basically are lining the, the actual... Uh, the, um, the, the, the air sacs okay so I'm kind of uh, okay 300 years my microscopy <laughs> yes you're reminding me that's the thing here uh, we're just celebrating 300 years uh, microscopy he passed away in 1723 and I thought it would be kind of a nice idea um, to make videos in his memory and if you put this uh, hashtag into the description of your video then everyone's able to find it uh, and uh, even if your YouTube channel is not pushed by, uh, or your videos are not pushed by YouTube so much, by having this hashtag, um, it would be easier to find your videos. Yeah? So I encourage everyone, or invite everyone to simply uh, make videos, uh, put the hashtag on it, and then um, we're able to have a little, um, yeah, uh, 
a couple of videos in 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 his in his memory okay let me where are the alveoli well the alveoli are those air sacs these are the air sacs in, in the lungs so if you basically make a cross section of the lungs you're going to see that the 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 holes so to say or the, yeah uh, these are actually referred to as the alveoli yeah. um, please a question from the fungus video is it easy to detect is a pipe of water is spoiled with fungus by sampling the water is it basically when you put a when you <laughs> okay uh, in other words uh, when you put a um, the water from a pipe uh, under the microscope are you able to detect then uh, whether the water is okay or not or whether there's some some contamination in there um, let's put it this way not with conventional methods you have to understand the following that uh, when you take a sample of if you take a sample of the water and put it under the microscope it could be that you do not see anything even though it is contaminated because the concentration might be too low um, generally you have to filter the water number one um, um, to detect if there are any cells in there um, and then if you find cells it does not really mean that it's um, they're all automatically bad or so right um, so this basically means that um, if you want to do a water quality assessment you actually have to do a proper microbiological analysis yeah? um, so simply by looking at the water if you see something that uh, under the microscope uh, from the tap water if you actually do see then you definitely know that of course there's got to be something there yeah um, but uh, just because you don't see anything does not mean there is nothing there yeah so this is a little bit the thing so if you have any doubts with it with this you have to essentially do a proper uh, microbiological test usually what they do is, is they will filter the water um, and then from the filter they will try to um, basically cultivate bacteria or fungi whatever is in there right um, but just by looking at uh, at the water with a microscope it's not uh, not reliable yeah because uh, still uh, the concentration is too low yeah Do you have any slides of uh, sclerosis from the cervical or thoracic spine? No, unfortunately not. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, I don't have uh, a lot of slides with uh, medical um, things on here. Uh, can you adjust the exposure and price so that it's not? Yes, I can. Um, essentially, I'm already at maximum brightness. Uh, but what I can do is I can open the condenser. Yes. Yes, that's much better like this, okay? So that's uh, essentially, uh, but at this high magnification, maybe it's not such uh, a good idea anyway, because at the lower magnification, we're able to see the overall uh, structure much better, okay? What happened to your Olympus CH40? Well, I still have it. Um, that's, uh, my Olympus CH40 microscope was the first one that I got, yeah, um, and it's uh, still, yeah, I still have it. Um, but I'm not uh, currently actively using it as much as I'm using this one over here. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is one of the fun and educational streams. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. What time is it even? It's 1 hour 17 already. Um, I have to be honest with you. I did. I put my fun fungi slides somewhere over there and I don't remember which one it is from last week. Um, so you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it out and... Um, I don't remember unfortunately see always label your slides always label your slides and because I made several permanent slides and I don't know rem I now don't remember what it is but there is another slide I just want to show you uh, which I did label this is a slide okay so we're, we're leaving the human body now these are filamentous algae, of course, a couple of ear bubbles. What's so special about this? I made it last year. I made it last year and I used this glue here as a mounting medium, this PVA glue that I already talked about. And uh, I just pulled it out again recently because I just wanted to see and you see that it kind of still is still usable, the slide. So this is kind of a, like a, a one year test that this PVA glue actually does work for preserving. I mean, the air bubbles, of course, they are in there. Yeah. And what is this here? Do you see this? This is a water crustacean. 
okay also preserved in glue and, and two two gigantic air bubbles so uh, this was a little bit uh, just to demonstrate a little bit uh, yeah um, um, just to, to demonstrate a little bit that uh, yeah this uh, PVA the water-based PVA glue actually does work so what, what, is, what is this one over here um, this is also a sample where I don't which I made recently oh okay that's dust so that is basically the dust uh, I remember I made some time ago I made, I made uh, some du a dust slide so these are basically dust fibers textile fibers also in PVA glue okay so I think this is gonna I think it's one of the my new favorite mounting media now because um, it's water-based and it's uh, therefore quite easy to use and yeah, it's the dust what else do I have here what is this here I don't I don't know what this is here let me check this Ah, uh, is this ah this is this seems to be is this the fungus okay this could be yes this could be the fungus you see the hyphae but they're quite hmm yep but the contrast is not very good yeah yeah I think this here is the fungus that I uh, prepared last time but which I did not separate very well but here we see the individual over here uh, I did not separate well but you see the individual um, hyphae which are the basically the the cells of the fungus okay which I made last week yeah. but uh, I think uh, as we see it's way too dense here here we see the cells better it's way too dense and the contrast is not very high hmm. so maybe I should have stained it and uh, what is this here it's also one sample that I made using this uh, PVA glue and the, these are um, all the algae and they uh, I made those last week so not last year like the other ones but essentially just last week and I think uh, that the glue preserves them quite well okay so um, yeah what I'm I going to I'm going to quickly go through the remaining questions and then I think I'm going to uh, call it a, a day again um, what brand is this microscope I only see it being used during your live streams well um, I also use it uh, for my uh, regular videos it's an Olympus yeah um, yeah it's uh, an Olympus microscope um, I would say that uh, the brands generally are yeah not so important it really depends more which type of specific microscope model serves your purposes best okay but that's also on Olympus yeah so um, do you use the PVA glue uh, what, what, what does it say do you use the PVA glue um, do you use the PVA glue neat? Yeah, uh, what I do is, is the PVA glue that I have here um, is uh, basically uh, um, yeah one of the reasons why I use this, uh, especially for algae and for water organisms, is because it's water-based and therefore it does not dry out the specimen uh, quite as much if you use a, a basically mounting media that contain organic solvents for example uh, what can happen is, is that uh, the specimen loses the color because the color is kind of washed out for example if you use um, yeah, yeah, mounting media like uh, uperol or so that which can uh, contain solvents then there is the danger that they will dissolve some of the pigments of the specimens and then it will kind of be washed out of, of the specimen and they will lose color but if you use a water-based mounting medium then this is not going to happen uh, but then again um, it might not be suitable for all specimens because uh, it's uh, always a question of the refractive index yeah? so this is the, the, the reason why there are different mounting media available um, uh, because uh, 
uh, for the different uh, specimens depending of what you actually want to see uh? and that's why we've seen that uh, for some in some cases it doesn't uh, they don't work quite well because uh, the mounting media has a refractive index which doesn't match to the specimen and therefore you do not see all of the details uh? um, did you play with slime mold in the past <laughs> Uh, no, I didn't. Um, slime molds are, are quite interesting organisms. They have been doing quite a lot of research with slime molds um, because they are apparently able to find the shortest distance in a maze and so on. But I have not played around with those. But I've seen a whole bunch of videos with those. Yeah. Um, I heard that it's diluted with 10 to 15 percent water. Yes, it is what I have done. Uh, without actually measuring it. Um, you can of course use the glue directly. I have also done that, but um, I found it easier to uh, be used if I add around 10% water. Yeah, um, It makes it a little bit more liquid and then it flows better, but it's possible to use it also directly. I would say it's, a, it's more a question of personal preference. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I think. Um, I hope I did not. Uh, uh, um, I hope that uh, I did not overlook any questions here. But um, I would say um, I would say I'm going to leave it at that for today. Okay. Um, so already one and a half hours anyway. Um, yeah. If you have again a couple of suggestions of uh, what you want me to cover in the live stream, please uh, do contact me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I'm going. I want to say all the best. <laughs> Okay, happy microbe hunting as always and do leave your comments behind um, if you have any specific suggestions or so because it makes it also easier for me uh, to, uh, yeah, to prepare things because sometimes I have a problem. I don't really know what to talk about so much um, because also sometimes it's becoming a little bit repetitive because I've talked about the things before but then there are a couple of new people always joining in who don't know about the things that I've talked about before. So you see it's always a little bit kind of a, um, finding the correct balance is always an issue a little bit. But in any case, uh, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that again. I hope you liked it again. Um, yeah, see you around uh, again and bye-bye. Uh, All the best, happy microbe hunting. And I have to somewhere stop stream. Okay, see you. Bye-bye.